Can anyone tell me why this slide is up? The muscles are on top of the skeleton, right? We actually started with the skeleton when we were talking about the gesture. The muscles are kind of like connected to all the skeleton. So I kind of think about the skeleton equal to the construction of a building. Uh, why do we start with cement? Uh, we start with a cement foundation, right? Uh, and then from that foundation, what goes atop the foundation? Huh? Framing. framing. And the framing is usually made of wood because wood is hard. You can actually see the foundation right underneath us, right? We're standing on a cement floor, cement floor. Uh, and the reason is because it's hard. It's rigid and the structure won't shift, right? It's also because we live in California and if there's an earthquake, everything's going to fall apart. Uh, same thing happens when I think about drawing, right? We want to build things on a very structured framework. We want to build things on something that's rigid. Why do we use a rigid framework to establish the drawing? I mentioned this earlier. Yes? Exactly. Muscles will always change, right? We are flexing and contracting. You pick up a bag of groceries, your arm is going to shift in three different positions, right? It's going to shift from flexed to contracted to extended. It's going to look different in all those views as you rotate your hand around. So we need to understand the placement of those muscles, but those muscles do not dictate proportions. They don't dictate uh, organization of muscles. They don't dictate how those shapes actually correspond to one another. The beautiful thing about the skeletons is the skeleton is consistent. So you can be a shorty, you can be four foot 11, or you can be like five foot 10, and the proportions of the skeleton for an adult are pretty much gonna be the same, right? We talked about this a little bit. Everyone remember? Yeah, no? Okay. So when I'm dealing with a skeleton, I'm always thinking about heads, right? We use heads as a way to compare size. And we always think about landmarks. And landmarks are the parts of those bones that do what? What do landmarks do? Why do we call them landmarks? They're joints, but what are they marking? Surface, right? So if it's a landmark, it's something that we can see. So what's a big landmark on the human body? One that I don't obviously need to point out, but I will. Your knee. Knee sticks out, right? We have a bone called the patella. Your whole skull is one big landmark because if you don't know it, right, you don't actually have that many muscles on your face. Most of your uh, shape is designated by your skull. So that is an anatomical landmark, right? And we have elbows, fingers, all sorts of things. Any rigid structure that protrudes, right, even the knuckles on my fingers are landmarks. We can use that to determine space, size, shape, length, relationships, and all that. So we're going to jump in, we're going to break this apart into individual um, pieces of the body, right? Uh, and we're going to kind of break it apart into hierarchies that we can understand in terms of shape. The first and the biggest one is the skeleton of the torso, right? Because that is kind of where everything connects. If I try and talk about everything today, we're going to sit here for six hours talking about the skeleton. Everyone's going to forget. The skeleton of the trunk is made up of three major landmarks. By looking at this beautiful image, what are those landmarks? Spine. Ribs. Pelvis. Yes. I want you guys to participate. Why? So that, so that you know your shit. So that you actually are remembering this, right? Uh, I can regurgitate, regurgitate, regurgitate. You guys are going to fall asleep if you just hear my voice. My voice, my voice will put you to bed. Uh, all right. Your spine is made up of a very specific number of bones. Uh, the spine has a very specific shape as well. If we think about the spine, right, you're actually going to see its inherent shape is this, like, S-curve. That S-curve runs down the cervical spine and ends in the lumbar spine, and in the mid, it is actually called the dorsal spine. I think about the mid of the spine, I think about the fact that the words actually relate to different anatomical landmarks on different animals as well, right? The dorsal uh, fin on a dolphin or a whale, right? The cervix is related to a lot of different parts of other parts of anatomy, right? The lumbar is the part that hurts us the most because it's where all the pressure on our body sits. Uh, so when we think about these, the choreography of these bones, we actually will start to like understand why they're built the way they are, okay? So if I look at the cervical spine, right, you can actually see that it is different. What are the differences between the cervical spine than the rest of the spine? They're visual, what are they? Are they, they're smaller. Why do you think they're smaller? 
Yes, all you gotta do is this. What do we need to do with our neck all the time? We need to move it around, it needs to be flexible so the spine gets smaller. When you look at the lumbar spine, what happens to it? It is huge, right? Those spiny uh, uh, landmarks are actually very, very large because the muscles that connect to them are very, very strong, right? So it needs a lot of connection points. I like to say it's very articulated, it's very gnarled, it's very pitted. The muscles actually get really, really rough, right? Because they want connection points for, uh, not the muscles, the bones, because they want connection points for the muscles. There's also something very elegant about the spine. And that is, if you look at the silhouette shape of the spine, it reflects the silhouette shape of the what? The human body, right? Look, narrow, wide, narrow, wide. It is not accidental, right? The shapes of those landmarks are actually reflecting the function of those forms. So if you think about the inherent relationship that we have to the internal anatomy of our forms, there is always a way to decipher how the forms are actually functioning on the surface because of their relational shapes, right? If something is gonna be narrow and thin, it wants to be flexible and agile. If something's gonna be bulky and large, it wants to be stable. It wants to hold you upright. Make sense? Okay. This drawing by Degas, you'll actually see that the surface of the cervical spine tends to show. What do we call those surface areas? I just mentioned it. Landmarks, right? It has very specific landmarks on the form. Yes, that is my messy handwriting. Uh, the lumbar area of the spine tucks in. Why does it tuck in? Muscles get much wider, they get much bigger. So they actually do this thing where they kind of cave into and tuck into where the anatomy actually sits, okay? Much more thin, uh, I would say fascia-based muscles on the surface of your body up on top, right? Larger muscles down below, okay? When you look at this drawing by Gruez, if you don't know Gruez, it is spelled like this, right? You can actually see that he is establishing the center line even within the context of the close to really force the narrative of position, right? Twist and direction. So even when we're drawing things that exist on the surface of the form, do you want to ignore what's happening underneath the form? Ideally, no. You want those landmarks to kind of present themselves as a way to communicate how the shapes are actually existing on the form, okay? And then this old man by Dean Cornwell. This is spelled Cornwell. First name is Dean. Anyone know what his job was? Not the old man, Dean Cornwell. He was an American illustrator, along with Norman Rockwell and J.C. Leindecker. I personally think if you want to learn how to draw, go study American illustrators from the 30s, 40s, and 50s because they are amazing at it. Anyone know why they were amazing at it? Simply because of repetition. Illustration existed prior to computers, so they had to know how to draw, and they were drawing all the time out of their head. Repetition is super important. Those guys were extremely talented draftsmen, and they would take the figure and even push it farther so that they were delineating anatomical landmarks and things of significance, and you can see what is being delineated really, really clearly on this old man, right? The muscles of the ribs, muscles of the sternum, right, and the muscles of the shoulders, so all, not the muscles, the bones, right, because the skin starts to fatigue on uh, aged people, some, maybe not in 2024, because we have way too many calories in the world, but back in the day, uh, and you'll see those bony anatomies, or actually a bony anatomy on uh, elders are really fun to draw because their muscles are so clear, right? All right. When we talk about the uh, trunk, right, we also have another bony landmark called the uh, ribs. The rib cage is actually formed of a very specific number of bones. We can count them, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we flip to the other side, 11 and 12. You have 12 ribs. It's not 24, right? We count them as one single rib that goes all the way around the surface of the form. The two on the back are called floating ribs. We don't really see them as relative landmarks because literally they float kind of within the context of all your muscles, right? The ones on the front are the really prevalent ones. And there's a very specific shape that tends to happen with the rib cage in that it looks like a little heart that's kind of flipping upside down and kind of does something like that. 
okay? In the center of your ribs, you have this bone called the sternum. The sternum is also known as the Roman sword. When you look at the sternum, it has a very specific shape to it. Anyone know why it's called the Roman sword? It looks like a sword, right? It even has like a little bit of a handle right here. Boom, 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 boom. There is another reason it looks like it's called the Roman sword. Romans had very, very strong steel. If you've ever had anybody in your family have open heart surgery, what do they have to do to get to the heart? They take a saw and they actually saw through the sternum, right? I can get punched in my chest and that sternum will hold and resist a lot of that uh, weight distribution. So they actually have to break through that bone. It's a very, very strong bone. Not pleasant if you have to have that surgery at all. The other thing that's really important, so is the sternum a landmark? Yes, why? Because you can see it. All the muscles connect into the sternum, so you're always gonna have this cavity that kind of exists between the pectoralis major, right? Pectoralis major is a muscle on both men and women, right? The only difference is fat tissue, okay? The other thing that you're gonna have are these two bones that sit on both sides. The clavicle, right, it sits on the front of my uh, collarbone. It is the collarbone and the scapula sits on the back. And we're gonna talk about these. And the reason we see the trunk of the skeleton as a square is because when you start from the trunk of the rib cage as a square, when you start from the top of the rib cage and draw to your scapula and draw down, what you're actually doing is connecting the dots between all those landmarks of the bones, okay? So when we're talking about the whole trunk, we're actually grouping in the clavicle and the scapula with that silhouette shape, okay? Now, why is the rib cage a fascinating muscle, a fascinating bony landmark? If you look at it, you're gonna see something really peculiar with it, and that is that the bones actually change, right? These are bones. Can anyone tell me what this is? Cartilage, thank you. And if you look at that cartilage, right, why do you think half the bones are fused with cartilage? Yeah, you will notice this on a newborn baby like there is no tomorrow. Why? If you've ever seen a baby breathe, what happens? Hmm? It is weird, right? Because the muscles aren't really widely developed, right, and the lungs are really, really large, what happens to the rib cage? It expands and it contracts. You can see it really clearly. Right? And the ribs are actually flexible to some extent. Right? This is why we can bend. This is why you can grab something from the floor. They'll begin to kind of like crunch up right? and open up. I kind of imagine it like a slinky a little bit. Like if you've ever taken a slinky and kind of opened up a slinky and compressed it, it goes back to its shape. Kind of the same thing with a rib cage. So they're made to like hold these really important anatomical landmarks in place like your liver, your heart, your lungs, and keep it safe. But they're also opened right? And that space is relatively open so that we can have flexibility, so you can breathe, you can, your heart can pump blood, and all these things underneath, all these anatomical landmarks underneath, can actually function while under the comfort of their little home, okay? Last but not least, we have the scapula, not last, sorry, we're going to do two more, uh, the scapula, which is the only floating bone in your body. Why is it called a floating bone? Well, if you look at the scapula, it doesn't actually attach to anything. It just kind of sits right there where it's supposed to go. What's holding it in place? Your muscles. Your muscles are connecting to it. If you've ever had shoulder issues, you know that uh, the uh, teres minor, teres major, and infraspinatus, or what we like to call the rotor, rotor cuff muscles, right, are there to actually hold it in place and hold it on the surface of your form, but they are moving with your arm, right? So if my arm moves up, what do you think the scapula does? I wonder if I have that image here. It's an old, it's a new slide that I didn't, I don't think I put in. <clears throat> if your arm moves up, your scapula acts like a wing. It will actually flap outside of your form and it will change the silhouette shape of your rib cage and create a bump, right? On the other side, you can see it's not as dramatic. Why isn't it as dramatic? It's all dictated by your arm position. If my arm position is a little bit less dramatic, right, that bulge is gonna be less dramatic on my form. So one of the things I wanna keep in mind when we're drawing today is start memorizing what happens to the scapula. Start thinking about its relative shape. The overall shape of the scapula is a triangle. When you look at that triangle from behind, 
right? The peak of the triangle connects into the clavicle, right? It tapers down the backside of the spine. It goes about four ribs down, right to the base of your neck. It comes all the way down and it stops right here. Can anyone count the number of ribs for me and tell me where it stops? I'll count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It is more than halfway down. So is the scapula small? No, it takes up two thirds of your rib cage. It is pretty massive. Usually we ignore the top tongue of the scapula when we're drawing because you don't really see it. What we're really drawing is the point in space where it connects into your arm. And this is like in the middle of your deltoid, right here, okay? It goes all the way back to about rib nine and it comes down and it creates this triangle, okay? When it pivots, it pivots from this point in space, not from this point in space, right? So the scapula will actually shift in position and flip out, just like that, okay? So the main connecting point is actually in your deltoid, in your humerus. It's really a stability bone where it's stabilizing the relationship of your arm. This is why if you pull the shoulder muscle, your arm hurts, right? To the rest of the connection points in your torso, okay? Last but not least, we have your clavicle. Your clavicle is a little bit painful. If you actually put your fingers right here on the pit of your neck, you can actually feel where it kind of sits right on your sternum. It's a very important landmark, and it does not go straight, right? What does it do? It makes a curve, and it makes a circumference and goes all the way to these bumps right here. What do we call these bumps? Does anyone remember? This bump, boop. Let me close this out, reset this. This bump right here is called the acromion, and that is where the scapula and the clavicle meet. And I'm gonna start using that word all the time, okay? So if my acromion is this point right here, if I leave my arm down, my acromion's gonna make a bump. What's gonna happen if I lift my arm up? Can anyone tell me? You can do the exact same thing to your own arm. Anyone know? Is it gonna stay a bump? No, it's gonna become an indentation. So this is something that's really important across all the landmarks of your form. Landmarks change. The position stays the same, right? But we always want to be aware of where they are in space. So if I'm looking at it on top of my flesh, right, that bone is going to stick out because my deltoid is down. But as soon as I lift my deltoid up, what's going to happen to that landmark is the deltoid is going to wrap around that landmark and it's going to create like this indentation, like a little hollow right through here and the deltoid is gonna go into the rest of the arm, okay? And go that way, all right? Makes sense to everyone? So can you always find your acromion? Yes. What are you looking for? Placement, right? You're not looking for an indentation or a protrusion. You're looking for where that point in space exists. You are looking for an indentation or a protrusion. You're always looking for where that point exists on the middle of your deltoid, okay? Makes sense to everyone? All right, cool. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through this without stopping. I'm gonna go through the bones and we're gonna take a little break, okay? Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> so you can really see the articulation of a clavicle. Not everyone's clavicle is this curved, right? But it does tend to have a C-curve in it, okay? When you see it from a top, it really is kind of this amazing series of bones and you can really see how the clavicle and the scapula kind of extend out and meet and make that top of the square from the back, okay? It's gonna go out to about here. All right. So uh, usually I'll go through and I'll kind of point out landmarks. So let's do that really quick. If I look at this gruesque, you can see here's the clavicle right here, clavicle right here, right? It's going to go into that midpoint of the deltoid. Um, let's go back one. All right. Here's my spine. All right. Here is my scapula. It's going to go right to that point going to come down. I want you guys to really pay attention to this because it's going to be part of your homework. That little indentation right there, what's that called? Acromion, that point, that's where the edge of the scapula is, all right? And it's going to come down. And the one thing that I forgot to mention that I'm going to mention right now is you have about one space of scapula between the scapula, okay? If you look down here, Here's about where rib nine is. I will tell you rib nine, rib eight, and rib 10 stick out the most on the human form. And that is where the taper begins right around rib nine. And you can see the ending of the rib cage is like right there, okay?
So if we go back to this image right here, you can see this back view. Come on. All right, there's usually about one scapula space between the scapula on either side, okay? All right. Last but not least, we want to talk about the pelvis. The pelvis are these, uh, pelvis is a really complicated bone because it's kind of hard to really draw accurately. That's why we use symbols like the bowl, right? But it's actually made up of three different bones. You have two propellers on either side, three big bones. There's a lot of smaller bones. And on the back side, you have the sacrum. Uh, the sacrum to me kind of looks like this Neolithic like bug. It looks like a cockroach that came from like the pre-century. Uh, but I don't know. It's a very funky thing. And then this coccyx right here, anyone know the other name for the coccyx that we all like to use? Tailbone. If you hit it, it hurts. Not because it's a really important bone, but because there's a lot of nerves that run down the base of the coccyx, right? Just like the elbow. There's this nerve that runs right down the axis of the elbow and sits right on top of that bone. And if you ever hit it, right, it feels like that shooting pain that kind of goes up. Uh, same thing kind of happens in the coccyx. There are two differences between the male and the female pelvis, two significant differences. What is, what is one by looking at these images? Female's wider. Female's wider. Why? Babies. Babies, right? Pretty straightforward. You got to hold stuff, right? And the male pelvis is longer, right? Those are the two big significant differences. Other than that, the shapes are pretty much the same, uh, but that creates a different silhouette shape for the female versus the male. Okay? The male tends to have a more dense muscle, uh, a bony uh, tissue, so the male bones are heavier than the female bones. Majority of the time, it's not always the case, but uh, it's also because the mass of the muscles tends to be a little bit heavier on the, the male form as well, so we need a little bit more stability because we're fat asses, right? That's kind of how it goes. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. The propeller uh, of the pelvis is pretty unique in the fact that it looks like literally like one of those old school propellers, It's kind of like that. That's what I imagine, like a cartoon propeller. Uh, when you think about the pelvis, you're actually looking at two major landmarks. The first one is the iliac crest. When you think about like a cresting wave, that's kind of like how I imagine the iliac crest. We live next to the ocean, so it's an easy solution for us, right? The iliac crest actually runs all the way around the pelvis but it is not called the iliac crest all the way around. Uh, you'll see it called the anterior and superior. What does anterior and superior mean in medical terms? Front and back, right? So the iliac crest sits on the middle, anterior sits on the back, the superior sits on the front, okay? But we're just gonna reference it as the iliac crest, and that is that big cresting form. Do you see the iliac crest? What do you guys think? Yes, right? You can actually pinch it, you can feel it. It's that bone that sits right on the surface of your form and actually creates that little edge of like hard surface, right? Even if you have a little bit of a muffin top, right? That muffin top is there because your iliac crest is pushing all the muscles and all the fat tissue away from it because all the bones, are, all the muscles are connecting into the iliac crest, right? I got a little muffin top, so I got no problems with that. Uh, the acetabulum is the hole, right? I like to call it the cone for the ice cream. Uh, and if you look at the femur, you're going to know what I'm talking about, right? This is kind of like the ice cream cone. This is uh, the ice cream scoop. This is the cone, right? And it just kind of sticks inside the acetabulum where the femur is. And there's always a different type of bone that sits on the surface of things that connect. What do you think the big difference is between this bone and this bone? Just by looking at it. One is smoother. Why do you think it needs to be smoother? If you have friction, you have something that we like to call arthritis. And arthritis is painful, right? So the bones, when they're actually being formed in your uh, embryo, uh, in your mother's embryo, right, are being formed together. And they actually are supposedly, if everything happens correctly, form in a way where they're completely homogenous. And then there's like this little sack of liquid. I call it like oil, right? It's called a burr sac, which sits in between these major landmarks. So it's lubricating that movement over time. What happens sometimes with people that uh, get arthritis is that lubricating sac dissipates or breaks, and then the bones are hitting each other, and the bones after a while will act like sandpaper and they'll start kind of roughing each other up and they'll start hurting, okay? So this is why the bones actually look a little bit different. It's really not gonna affect us too much in drawing, but it's something you should probably know, okay? When you look at the anatomy of the acetabulum, you're not really going to see the acetabulum as a landmark. What are we going to see as a landmark on our pelvis? 
This guy right here, the great trochanter, right? That sticks out. The acetabulum is tucked underneath the gluteus maximus, right? Everything else kind of wraps around that. So what we're actually looking for is the iliac crest and the great trochanter. And that kind of establishes the landmarks of the pelvis. Okay, that tells us how wide everything is, right? You'll see the great trochanter as an indentation, right? Your glutes will kind of wrap into it and then another anatomical landmark will come out of there and it will also protrude. How will it protrude? Well, if I take my leg and I pull my leg in like I'm sitting Indian style, you're actually gonna see that that indentation begins to kind of stick out and the bone is pushing out against the leg, okay? Actually, it's crisscross applesauce. So we don't use Indian style anymore. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, so if we look at the, uh, this drawing by Degas, I'm going to point to a few things and you guys are going to tell me what this is. What is that? Rib cage. Thank you. What is this line? Sternum. What is this line? Clavicle. What are these? Iliac crest specifically, top of the pelvis. Correct. Okay. Now you should be able to look at this stuff and be like, oh, I see what I'm seeing. What is this? Great trochanter. It will tell you exactly where the axis of the pelvis is, right? You see this little curve right here, right where that curve sits. What is that? That is your iliac crest, right? The top of the pelvis. I'm going to see these bones. What are those bones? Ribs, right? The serratus muscle sits right on top of those bones. And if I look really closely, I'm going to see a silhouette of muscles that actually sits right there. What are those muscles sitting on top of? The spatula, exactly. Yes, that's what we just called it, okay? Uh, any questions about that? Yes? You're going to memorize them. You have no choice because they're going to stick in your brain, yeah. Uh, by the time you do your homework, you'll memorize them. Uh, if you look at this side of the torso, let's break this down really quick. You're going to see a bump right here, and you're going to see a bump right here, and you're going to see a bump right there, okay? What I want you to do is ignore the bumps. What I want you to start doing is looking at the shapes, okay? If you look at the relationship of these shapes to each other, you're gonna see it is a foreshortened triangle. That is a scapula, okay? If you look at this bump right here, that is a curve, that is a muscle, all right? That's the latissimus dorsi. The latissimus dorsi wraps all the way around and makes another curve down here and comes all the way down. So I don't want you to be tricked. Your scapula sits high on your, on your rib cage, okay? Uh, dun, 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 dun. All right, and then this is my favorite drawing because it's the man woman that Gruez likes to draw. <laughs> She's very scary. Uh, you know, right, they didn't use that many female models back in the day. They would just stick like female faces on male models. So this is kind of one of those great uh, examples of that. But you're gonna see this really uh, well-drawn triangle back here. What is this triangle that we're looking at? The, the no, the coccyx is hidden. It's like right there. <laughs> what do we call it? Anyone remember? Sacrum. Sacrum, correct, okay. Right here where you see these creases, right? What is that? Iliac crest, right? <laughs> she has a really big pelvis, right? It is like all the way down here. Right there is your great trochanter. Sorry, this keeps on flipping. Where this little curve is, what is that called? Thank you, chromian. It's gonna start right here. If I look right here, even when the shadows aren't that strong, I can look and see where my scapula is. Okay, the spatula. Is this a running theme, theme this, this semester? Is it gonna be called the spatula? <laughs> Uh, uh, and then there's the other scapula right there, okay? Uh, and then the rib cage is gonna come right through here, come right through here, right? So I can see where those forms are. Why am I showing you all this stuff? Uh, because when you look at your model, you need to be able to intuit, right, what's happening on the model without me, right? I'm trying to pass along information that's gonna help you, okay? Uh, and these landmarks are things that I hope you eventually memorize so that you can draw out of your head. All right, so when we think about uh, the anatomy of the torso, right, everything that we're kind of designing from here on out is really about the organization of those muscles on top, 
Okay, so you kind of want to start out with the skeletons just so you have an idea of where like connections exist and placement exists. Um, when you think about the torso, I like to kind of break it down into shapes I can recognize. So if you look at the torso, you're going to see it looks like the letter T. Okay. The top of the two muscles, the pectoralis major and the deltoid, uh, take up about, uh, I would say, uh, one-third of the torso. And then you could fit another pectoralis major here and here. Okay. So this is kind of why I break it up into thirds, just so we can kind of like understand placement a little bit. Okay. Uh, when I draw it, I kind of uh, imagine it as a really funny shape, right? It's kind of like, uh, I like to say it's kind of like a dog. Kind of is like a little cylinder, right? And then the deltoid are like ears. All right, there's your eyeballs. All right, and then there's the center. So for me, it kind of looks like, I don't know, a little bit of a dog shape. That's kind of what I want to imagine. But anyway, getting off topic. Let's jump into it, and we'll talk about all proportions and everything. So if you look at the front view, uh, you'll notice that something pretty unique happens with both uh, the front and back of the torso, and that is that they're split equidistantly right down the middle, okay? There is always a center line that you can find from the back view. What is the center line that you can find from the back view? your spine, right? What a lot of people don't realize is that there's also a center in the front view. It starts with your sternum, and it runs right in between your abdominal muscles and goes right into your pubic bone, okay? So you should always be able to distinguish where the center is in both front and back view. When you look at the muscles, they're broken into three major categories. The first one is the pectoralis major, right? We all know them as the pecs. Second one is the abdominal muscles. All, everyone knows them as the abs. And the third one are the obliques. I'm obviously leaving out the smaller ones. We're gonna talk about those a little bit later, okay? So those are the three big groups in the front. In the back view, it's a little bit different because they're actually not equidistant, right? They have really funky shapes. Can anyone tell me what this one is? Your trapezius, right? And then your lats actually come up and over. And the, I like to say it's kind of like the cape on your back. Right, your lats kind of wrap around. Okay, those are the two big landmarks. If you can figure out where those sit, all the other ones kind of sit in between. Okay, so let's break this down step by step and go through this. Okay, I'm gonna skip the side view and the back view. The pectoralis major has a really specific function. Okay, it is a weight bearing muscle. Anything with the word major after it means that it's pretty important, right? Minor, what do you think it means? Not important. Not important. Supporting, okay, we'll call it the supporting muscle. So it's like if I have a little brother, you know, little brother's kind of there to like punk around and kind of help me out and do what I say. Uh, the pectoralis major actually has a pectoralis minor underneath it. A lot of people aren't aware. The pectoralis minor actually sits like right here, okay? And just kind of supports all the function of your pectoralis major. The pectoralis major has a really unique function. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but when you see it connect, it actually twists and connects into your humerus. So you're gonna see a line that actually goes in this direction into your pec, right? Has everyone noticed that before? That line actually wraps around and curves, okay? I like to think about it as potential energy. Potential, yes. Uh, and the potential energy gets released when it opens up your arm, right, into kinetic energy. So you open up a lot more muscle strength when you actually lift up your arm. This is why you can lift and push a lot of weight, like if you're doing a bench press or if you're doing a push-up or if you're holding groceries, right, because your potential energy all of a sudden becomes kinetic energy as it kind of like shifts into space, right? So it's a pretty amazing kind of function. The connections of your uh, pectoralis major go from your clavicle, right? But it leaves a space, so it starts from halfway point of your clavicle, goes to the end of the clavicle, runs all the way down the sternum, does not cross the sternum. Why doesn't it cross the sternum? Because you can see the what? The bone, the landmark, right? It's showing, right? It goes into your rib cage, comes up and over, and goes into your humerus. Now, are those a lot of bony connections? Yes. It is connecting into one, two, three, four bones, not including all the individual ribs underneath, okay? Why does it have a lot of bony connections? 
what did we just say? It is a major muscle. It is a weight-bearing muscle. So when something has to hold a lot of weight, has to have a lot of muscle connections because what is it doing? Yeah, exactly. It is supporting your function. It is weight-bearing. It is holding all those landmarks together, okay? The pectoralis major is split into two different sections, one on the left and one on the right. We all know this, but that twist is a really important thing. Why is that twist a really important thing? What happens to the line work that we draw when we are drawing the pectoralis major as it goes up? It makes the inside of your armpit. That line gets really fat, right, and really thick. If I drop it down, that line gets really thin and pinches. So the actual physical type of line that I'm uh, drawing will actually change based on the direction of that muscle group, okay? So form is always kind of following function. When you look at the pectoralis major in side view, it protrudes out. There's that, spectra, uh, that uh, sternum that sits in between, and then it kind of curves back around, okay? Make sense so far? All right, cool. The rectus abdominis. What is the other word for the rectus abdominis? Your abs, right? Your abs, what people don't know, actually sit underneath your pectoralis major, right? They kind of fuse. And all muscles tend to overlap to some extent and have this, like, relationship where they all kind of work together. So my abs, you know, if I pull my ab muscle, right, if I try and lift up my arm, my pectoralis is going to hurt because those abs might be torn or pulled. So all those relationships are going to exist. But the abs start at the ninth rib, 10th, 11th, 12th, no, 8th, 7th, 7th rib. 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, yeah. Uh, they kind of come up right where the base of the sternum is. And the abs are broken into like three major sections. This one right here, right, this one in the middle, and this one on top. This little tissue that you see right here that lo looks like a split is actually not a split. Let me go back. Let me look at this image. Yeah. Uh, the tissue right down here that looks like a split is actually not a split, okay? You have this line that runs down the abdominal muscle called the linea alba. And I always make a joke. You know, I kind of think about Jessica Alba. Uh, and that perfect torso when she was at her prime. And she always had that line that ran right down the center of it, so it kind of helps me remember. Linea alba, right? That division between the abdominal muscles that run down the form, okay? You'll see them on, you know, fairly uh, lean people, I would say, more than anything else, okay? Come on. Sorry, my f thing is frozen. Uh, when you're looking at the anatomy, right, most of the top of the abs is actually covered right through here. You're going to see one, two, right? Three major sections, right? We always talk about the six pack. It is not an eight pack. And you're going to notice that something very specific happens, that the lines actually move in very specific directions when you're talking about the divisions of the abs. It's not accidental, right? They don't change. They almost all look like that. Why do you think the division between the abs looks like that? What do I want to do when I'm bending? I want to pick something up. We talked about this. The form of your, uh, of your muscles are actually designed to actually, I would say, capitulate the form of the direction of your movement, right? So if I want to bend in this direction, just like the lines in your fingers, right, it's going to help me bend in that direction. Yes, Gabby? What does capitulate Support. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just pushing you guys to expand your vocabulary a little bit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the abs make up about 50% of the front of your torso, or one half, right? So when I'm drawing it, I like to go from, uh, and this is just my thing, uh, nipple line to nipple line. So you'll see like your nipples right here and right here, and that kind of extends how wide the abs are. And this is really important because I'll see people make this mistake often. Well, they'll draw like the abs really, really narrow or really, really wide, and it makes the proportions look a little bit funky, especially when you're drawing a nude figure. You want to be aware that the uh, obliques are what make up the rest of the form, and the obliques are not that wide in front view. They're wide in side view, okay? So the obliques then come down, starting with the serratus muscles right here. The serratus muscles are spelled S-E-R-R-A-T-U-S. And the obliques, the obliques have changed their name. They're now spelled like this. So this is an older book, all right? 
so the serratus muscles come down and connect into the ribs, and then they fuse into the obliques, which mostly exist down below, okay? When I'm looking at the internal and external obliques, the internal obliques are the sheath of muscle that actually sits underneath everything. It connects into the pelvis, right? Into the iliac crest, and it goes into the lower rib, starting at the 10th rib but you don't really see your internal obliques. What do you see? Your external obliques. And when you look at them side by side, you can kind of see why your internal obliques are there, but they're not really there, right? They're actually covered because the external obliques are a lot bigger. When you look at this image, you can kind of see the metaphor. The, the obliques I kind of imagine to be, uh, what's that thing that women wear, that Titan corset, right? Uh, they're actually there where there is no bony anatomy, right? They sit between your rib cage and your pelvis. So your obliques, which a lot of people aren't aware of, are actually really important in stabilizing you. If you ever have back problems, it's not just because your abs are maybe weak, it's actually because your obliques are weak, because your obliques do this thing where they wrap all the way around. So everyone's kind of trying to do setups like this when they actually should be like tilting from side to side and holding some weight and doing twisting exercises because that's what's gonna stabilize that lumbar region, right? So in between your rib cage and your pelvis, what is the only bony landmark that exists? Rib cage and pelvis, what's the bony landmark that connects them? Your spine. Your spine is just a narrow tube. Did you say that, Liz? Yes. Sorry, I just didn't hear you. Uh, you're all the way on the other side, so all I hear is <laughs> uh, Your spine is just a narrow tube. So if that tube needs support, that tube has to have muscles that wrap all the way around connecting the top bony landmark to the bottom bony landmark. So they're connecting rib cage to pelvis, and then they're doing this thing where they're like tightening and tightening and tightening that area like a corset. So the obliques have a really important role in kind of pulling the sides together. And what are the abs doing? They're stabilizing the front of your core, and then you have these back muscles that are stabilizing the back of your core, okay? So I kind of want to like have you guys start visualizing this, that it's built uh, in four different quadrants, right? Your whole body is built in four different quadrants where you have like a left and a right side and a front and a back. Even when I look at the deltoid or if I look at the bicep, every one of those individual muscles has like four different sides of those muscles, okay? Does that make sense? This is why if you ever go to the gym and you start working out, you're gonna know you don't just do one bicep exercise or one like leg exercise because you have multiple sides to those muscle groups that need stabilization and they have to equal each other. If they don't equal each other, then you become deficient in certain movements and that's when you get hurt, okay? The obliques uh, have a very funky kind of silhouette shape in that they don't really have a shape, right? They're just kind of like one fascia tissue that is made up of muscles but they do have a very specific look to them. They will kind of like come up and around the iliac crest, wrap into the iliac crest from behind, and they'll kind of do this. Well, they'll wrap up into the muscles and begin to connect into individual ribs, okay? So they start as one big fatty tissue and then they'll start to separate out. Does everyone kind of see that? Okay. And they separate out so that they can have points of connection on the ribs. Why? Because they're stabilizing your ribs to your pelvis. They're kind of like pulling the two together in organization with each other. And they're kind of connecting all the way into uh, the iliac crest. And when you look at the striations, does anyone know what a striation is? The lines that actually constitute the individual muscles, right? You'll see these little lines that actually, you'll see, uh, that make up the muscle groups. The striations will tell you exactly where the muscles are going, right? The abdominal muscles are going down. The obliques are, sorry, this is the internal oblique. The external oblique muscles are going up, right? And they're pulling, pulling, pulling until they actually connect into those rib cages. So they're actually doing this thing where they're pulling those two bones together and kind of like tightening them, okay? If that makes sense. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And then you have the anterior serratus muscles. And these are kind of funky muscles because you will always see them almost on anybody, but you don't see all of them. Why don't you see all of them by looking at this image? They're under, right? They're hidden. The only ones you'll see really are these top three right here because they wrap around and they stick out. And those, if you see the alignment of them, if I start counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
Rib six, seven, and eight are the ones that protrude the most on the human form. And where is rib six sitting within the context of your ribs? If you have 12, halfway down. So all I gotta do is bend over, huh? And I'll feel this little protrusion right here, right underneath my armpit, that is rib six, rib seven, and rib eight. Go right there, and you can actually feel those three muscles kind of wrap around, and they will stop right when they get to your ab. All right, so if I look at the connection of the serratus muscles, I'm actually seeing these four, and I'm not seeing the rest of them because they're tucked underneath all the other muscle groups, okay? You have serratus muscles that kind of tuck underneath your pectoralis major, and serratus muscles that will begin to like extend underneath your obliques. The one thing that I want to point out though is that they have a very specific directional difference. The serratus muscles, give me one second, Tara. The serratus muscles look like fingers, and they wrap around your muscles like horizontally, almost like they're holding onto them, right? Your obliques do what? They tilt. They come up like this. So there's a very specific, uh, a different direct, uh, directional relationship between them. Your obliques want to wrap into and pull your muscles towards your rib cage. Your serratus muscles are stabilizing, and they also do something kind of crazy. They help you breathe. They expand and contract with your bones. Yes, Tara. You got to speak up and ask me that one more time. Uh, the serratus muscles are more defined, and they are always all the muscles have a different purpose. Yeah, but they do tend to work together. I mean, they all work together when they connect. Right? So your serratus muscles are helping you breathe, right? They're stabilizing you from the side of your core to the front. Your obliques are just stabilization muscles, really, and they're helping you twist and turn, okay? They're not helping you with your breathing so much, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, I will tell you this is much harder to do when you start drawing it, but I'm just trying to like get all this information downloaded into your brain, okay? <laughs> is it too much information? All right, we're not gonna talk about that. Let's talk about the muscles of the back. What are the two big muscles of the back that we've mentioned? Traps. Lats. Lats. Okay, that's the shorthand for them. Your trapezius looks like a starfish or a star, right? Kind of does this thing where it actually begins at the back of your neck, so it is a neck muscle. Your trapezius will work. If I tilt my head forward, you're actually gonna feel that pinch run all the way down your back, right? That is your trapezius. If I lift one arm up, right, your other arm is gonna stay. Your trapezius is working, but it's divided on one side. So if it didn't have that division in it, if I lifted this arm up, right, my other arm would wanna lift up. So we have this bifurcation of the muscle groups from one side to the other so that we can have independent movement, right? Your trapezius looks like what I like to call like a clothes hanger. If I look at that silhouette shape, it kinda comes up and over, and then it comes up and over, it connects. It is shaped like the hanger that I hang my clothes on, okay? It has this very specific curve that comes out to every shoulder, to each shoulder, and then it goes into the back of your neck and it connects to the, uh, I'm blanking out on the name of the bone, occipital, I think, bone in your skull, okay? The back of the trapezius will go and connect into, let me see, the spine of the scapula, okay? Right through there and right through there. And then as soon as the spine stops, the trapezius drops. And you'll see that this little edge of the trapezius, what's it doing for the scapula? It's holding it in place, right? So the scapula is actually being held in place by the trapezius as much as it's being held in place by all the rotor cuff muscles that we're gonna be talking about that connected to the arm. The trapezius is one of the main ones, okay? Then it comes down and it goes all the way into like a little taper and it fuses right at the base of the rib cage. So if my rib cage goes halfway down my body, my trapezius also goes halfway down my body, okay? It is not a small muscle. It is a very important muscle. It is a dominant muscle, okay? Does everyone see how the shape is dictated by its connections into the occipital bone? Makes a curve, stops right at the acromion, 
comes into the base of the spine of the scapula, follows that angle of the scapula. It's gonna tell you exactly where the scapula is if you look for it because the scapula sticks out and then it drops. And it makes like a really tapered curve and it comes right into the middle of the base of the spine or the end of the rib cage, okay? On the other side is the latissimus dorsi. And the latissimus dorsi, uh, sorry, the pectoralis major makes the front of your armpit. The latissimus dorsi makes the back of your armpit, okay? The armpit is not like its own little muscle. Uh, the lats actually stick into the humerus as well, just like the, lat, just like the pectoralis major does. The lats will go, come up from the humerus. They'll cover the base of the scapula. Why is that important? so that your scapula doesn't fly off of your torso, right? The lats are actually acting as kind of like this sliding movement for the scapula, and they'll kind of hold the scapula against your ribs, okay, from the bottom. It'll come straight across, go into the other humerus, and where it's connecting is really all through here on the spine, okay? Super, super important, and this is why the uh, sacrum is the sacrum. The sacrum looks really knotted and pitted because that lat muscle is extremely strong. And it is a stabilization muscle. It's not too much of a function muscle unless you consider it a pushing and pulling muscle. But it is taking all those obliques and it is doing what to them? It is like tightening them. It's the corset on the back of your body and it's stabilizing them and holding them in place because there is no bone right there, right? It's all muscle tissue that is stabilizing you and keeping you upright, okay? So all those muscles are working in tandem with each other. And when you look at the space where the latissimus is, right? What's gonna go right here? Can anyone tell me? Obliques, so you can see how your obliques and your lats will actually work hand in hand because your obliques are actually gonna go underneath your latissimus dorsi and back view, and they're gonna be kind of like supporting each other, okay? All right, in a three-quarter view, your obliques, uh, your lats are a little bit tricky because they'll actually stick out. Why are they sticking out? Well, they're the topmost muscle, right? They're actually sitting on top of a circular surface. What's that, circum what's that circular surface? Your rib cage. And the circle of the rib cage, right, actually protrudes on the sides. We just talked about that. It protrudes at ribs six, seven, and eight. And it protrudes on the other side, and it's sitting on top of every other muscle group, including the serratus and the pectoralis muscle, uh, the pectoralis major. So that means I can pretty much see my lats in almost every single view, even if it's just a small portion of it, right? It's gonna come around and around, and it's gonna connect and draw down, okay? Does that make sense to everyone so far? All right, cool. So in a front view, now I should be able to start identifying these muscles. What is this muscle right there? I was just talking about it. Those are your lats, right? So if I look at it in back view, and I look at it in front view, right? What I'm actually seeing is the connection of the armpit right through there. And it's going, which way is it going? Backwards, right? Into the rear of your spine, okay? What are these muscles right here called? Serratus muscles. What are these called? Obliques. Gabby's not allowed to answer. What are these called? Obliques. Obliques. What is this one called? Pecs, right? What about these abs? And then you have your obliques right here, okay? I'm just gonna call them the obs, okay? Your deltoids are an interesting muscle, okay? They are called deltoids, and they are named after a Greek term, uh, after the River Nile, called the delta. Can anyone tell me why? Yes, ma'am. Exactly. It is a triangle. If you look at the, the deltoid in all three views, right? I like to say that they have three different heads. They have a front-facing head, a side-facing head, and the lateral head, or lateral, medial, and 
uh, front. Um, the heads actually look like individual triangles in all views, right? And they come up and they close the gap between the pectoralis major, right? Which was doing this, and doing this. Sorry, I forget how to draw it for a second. <laughs> the pectoralis major, which is doing this. It's over here, right? They're actually sharing the pec uh, connection to the clavicle. And then they share the pec connection to the opposite side of the humerus. Now, if they're only connecting to two bones, which two bones are they connecting to? Clavicle and the humerus. Are they as important as your pectoralis major? No, but they are significant to your arm. They help to lift things. They help to directionally connect the arm, uh, move the arm in different positions. But they do have a very specific shape, right? In front view, they look like a triangle. In side view, uh, they look like, I should say this is front really. This is side, right? In front view, they look like a teardrop triangle. They kind of do this, right? And then in back view, they also look like a triangle. And you're gonna notice they do something very interesting. They actually wrap around the clavicle and the scapula connection, and they, they kind of meet somewhere in between, and they look like a horseshoe, right? So they don't cover that connection, and this is why you can see your acromion, because your acromion is right here. What covers this connection right here? Your traps. So your traps and your deltoid and your lats and your pectoralis major, if I lift my arm up, all those muscles are actually working together, okay? It's not just your deltoid. So we have to understand that the function is really homogenous with the relationship of those muscle groups. Really, really important. The deltoid goes to about one third of the way down the arm. So if it's going one third of the way down the arm, is it a small muscle or a big muscle? It's big in relationship to the arm. It is the biggest muscle on the arm. It actually sits on top of the arm. Here you can see the acromion and it comes about one third of the way down and it wraps into the form. Now, in a default position, meaning if my arm is rested, it's pretty easy to figure out where the deltoid is. But as soon as my arm goes up, what else is moving? Mr. Scapula. And I will tell you, it makes it very confusing for people to find this connection right here because the scapula can almost go vertically from a horizontal position. And if it's going vertically, that means my deltoid is actually changing in position from where it connects. It's going from this position right here, right, to this position, oops, to this position right here. And that is practice, right? You're not gonna be able to memorize that the first time out because you have to kind of find all the muscles and their relationship to each other, but I do want you to be aware of that at least, okay? Deltoid looks like what? A triangle. Connects like a horseshoe. Uh, the rotor cuff muscles are made up of three major muscles. The infraspinatus, the teres minor, the teres major. We don't really see this one. Can anyone tell me why we don't see the sup uh, supraspinatus muscle? It's on the inside covered by the, the traps, okay? Right, because the traps are connecting right through here, the spine of the scapula, okay? When you look at these three muscles, they have a very specific shape category. This one's big, this one's small, this one's medium, okay? So if I can just organize it in terms of like how big they are, sometimes it makes it easier for the me to understand them. The infraspinatus is the biggest one. Teres minor is actually telling you that it is the smallest one. Teres major is telling you that it is the bigger one. So if I just remember that, I can remember how to break apart these three and make sense of them. The infraspinatus is the biggest one. It wants to connect into, uh, let me see, go back. It wants to connect into the head of the humerus, head of the humerus, head of the arm, uh, the base of the humerus, right? So if they're all connecting from the scapula to the humerus, what are they helping me do? Move your arm, right? That's why they're called the rotor cuff muscles, okay? They're literally there to help the scapula rotate, okay? The reason the scapula is not connected to any part of the body and it is floating bone is so that your arm can rotate and have full range of motion, okay? So my infraspinatus, the way I like to draw is once I've drawn the deltoid, once I've drawn the latissimus, once I've drawn the trapezius, you're gonna end up with a very specific shape. All you gotta do is remember to draw the letter Y. The letter Y goes like this and it tapers. 
okay? If I can remember how to draw this letter Y and remember that about uh, at about that point, the infraspinatus is gonna connect, then I will remember how to draw those forms in place, okay? The big thing I want you to understand is that this big shape is all a rotor cuff muscle and you're, you're gonna see this bump on the scapula from time to time because of how it separates from the trapezius and from the latissimus, okay? So if I begin to shift my arm back, why do the muscles change shape? Can anybody tell me? Yeah, the scapula is actually changing position and shape. Yes. So if I take my arm and I move it backwards, right, it's kind of like the notion that the scapula, if you believe in evolution, is like this hybrid transition between the wings of a bird, right? You're actually shifting the wings back and forth and you can begin to like flap your scapula to some extent and create that pinch and that stretch, right? If I, I can move and shift those muscles around, but they're actually following the bones underneath, okay? So always remember the position of the scapula can change dramatically. I can pinch them, right? And they'll actually move those muscle groups independently of one another. And I can begin to uh, understand how to organize those shapes a little bit better, okay? So that's pretty much it for the muscle groups.